The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, my name is Fuji Wittenberg and I will be going over options for artists and entertainers today. We will get started in about two minutes. We're just going to wait for um, the other participants to join and give everyone some time to get settled in. So we'll be starting very soon. Hi everyone, uh, I think we're going to get started, okay? Um, so you're here listening to the webinar. These are options for artists and entertainers. My name is Fuji Wittenberg and I am with the Wolfsdorf Immigration Law Group. I'm an attorney here and uh, we're based in Los Angeles. So we have a lot of experience and exposure to artists and entertainers being in the heart of Hollywood. So. Um, Thank you for joining us in today's session. Just a, a couple of quick things, you know, to let you guys know. A copy of the PowerPoint will be made available afterwards. I believe you'll be receiving an email from, you know, the administrator with a link, uh, with either a link to our website where you can access this presentation or a copy of the PowerPoint. And then also really quickly, I just wanted to, you know, in addition to welcoming you guys, I wanted to also let you know that you know, I'll be going through all of these options and providing you with information. Hopefully there'll be a, a Q&A at the very end where I can answer any questions that, um, that I'm able to get to. But I wanted to also let you guys know that, you know, each case really is different and so the strategy will vary, you know, based on the, the facts of your particular situation or your case. So this is not meant to be construed as legal advice and it's for informational purposes only. Um, it's a quick matter of business. And then we can get started. Okay, so you know, basically, the, the there are only a few options for artists and entertainers, and the O visa is really the main option. It's for artists of extraordinary ability, and there are, are three classifications. Um, there are two main ones. So O1A is science, education, business, or athletics. So athletes are included in there. And fashion models, I do a lot of fashion models, and they're included in this higher standard, um, which is in this, this O1A category. The second category is O1B, which is arts or, or motion picture and TV, and that's probably where a lot of you will, will fall under. And so that's, those are two within that second one. Um, so artists would be, you know, artists, musicians, you know, VFX artists, animators, uh, you know, dancers, stylists, and everything. And then the motion picture and TV has its own little subcategory where it has a slightly lower standard. Rather than extraordinary ability, it's extraordinary achievement. I know that sounds you know, pretty much the same, but there is actually a difference in, in the standards and you know, when we are completing the petition and, and you know, going through the criteria, it's a slightly lower standard, which is nice for a lot of people in the entertainment industry. Um, but the position, you know, that you'll be doing, actor, writer, cinematographer, director, producer, anything tied to motion picture or TV falls under that. Otherwise, you'll be 
in the arts category, and as I mentioned before, you know, models, fashion models, for whatever reason, are, are in the business category. Um, so that's the L1. That's the, the main visa category that all, most of you will fall under. And then there are a couple of extra, you know, there's the O2, which is for essential support personnel. So that would be, you know, if that be, and you're tied to the O1. I'll go through this in more detail later. But that would be, you know, let's say an associate producer tied to an O1 for a producer. So it's kind of like more of an assistant, like an essential support personnel. O3 visas are for your dependents. So your spouses and children fall under the O3, and there is unfortunately no work authorization um, in, the, in the dependent category. So we'll move through and you know, kind of get into more detail about the standards that I was discussing earlier. So as you can see, the O1A, you know, the business, science, and that's your professors, researchers, they have a slightly higher standard. So it's, you, know, you have to show that you are one of a small percentage. O1B for the arts category, for most entertainment people, um, it's extraordinary ability. So it's high level of achievement in the field. And again, I know it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but there is a difference between the two standards, and that's you know, basically done by you know, hopefully your lawyer, whoever is helping you prepare this petition. And um, then the third you know, category, that's, it's still under art, but it's film and TV. It's extraordinary achievement by a very high level of accomplishment, and you're you're compared against you know those that are ordinarily encountered. So again, it's a slightly lower standard, and you'd be surprised. Um, most of you, if you have what you have, is, is probably more than what most ordinary people have. So the basics, you know, that we'll discuss are either the filing procedures. So you have the actual petition. So you have to, you know, complete the forms, and you have to decide, you know, where it's going to be filed. And the basic elements that we always tell everyone: one is the evidence, which you would need to meet these criteria that I described above, and we'll go through the criteria a little bit in a little bit. But you have to show that you meet the criteria in the first place, and then you have to have a sponsor. So a big misconception is that. If the O1 is a freelance visa or you know it's something where you don't really need an employer well that's that's you know it doesn't necessarily have to be an employer in the classic sense but you do need a sponsor so you need a petitioner so if it's not an employer in the classic sense then it should be an agent or a manager as the petitioner you, you can't and you know you are tied to that employer or agent or manager you're not able to freelance um, in the way that you think that you can if you're interested in being, let's say, you know, it's better for me to use examples. So let's say you are an actor and your agent or manager sponsors you. That allows you to work on different projects, so for different companies, but only as an actor and, you know, only on the types of productions that are included in the visa petition. So not everything's going to be included. You know, people are going to tell me you're crazy. You know, right now you don't know what you'll be doing in two years because it is. You know, you're applying for three years. Of course, you're not going to know. But everything would have to be done through your agent or manager, and you can only act. So I get a lot. You know, let's say I do a lot of models, and a lot of them want to do some modeling and some acting. Unless it's described in the petition that you do both. If you have an O1 as a model, you can only be modeling. If you have an O1 as an actor, you can only, you know, be acting. So that's something to also keep in mind. Um, and that also ties into the events. So when you are filing for the petition, we have to show that you have upcoming projects, and that's usually done by, you know, an itinerary or contract or a deal memo with other people. So let's say you are an actor and you're here to you know, you've been, you've auditioned and you've been selected to perform a certain role, we would actually need some sort of a deal memo or contract showing you that's what you'll be doing. Or um, let's say you're a photographer, it would be with, you know, let's say a magazine or something that they want to use you for these particular editorial shoots um, or these, you know, different productions. And they can, you can spread them out. But anyway, you have to somehow be able to uh, describe what you'll be doing while, while you're here. 
Okay, so the criteria. This is everyone's biggest question, you know, how do I know if I qualify? And I know it sounds, you know, like the criteria is really difficult, but mostly for artists and entertainers, um, and here I've listed quickly on this first slide, you know, you basically look at your credits and see which are more impressive, and you narrow the field. So actor, you know, versus commercial actor. Some people think it's better, you know, to be more broad, but sometimes it's better to be more specific because, again, uh, you know, as we looked in the standards, you're being compared to other people in your specific field, not against, you know, other people in other fields. So it's better to be a commercial actor where you are specialized, let's say, in TV commercials rather than, you know, being compared to television or even bigger, you know, film actors. So that's just kind of a small point. And then, you know, here I've listed the sciences education, you know, the kind of the more business standard, the higher standard. As you can see, it's pretty difficult. And again, for, for any of you that are listening that happen to be models, this is where you fall in under. And, you know, there are only a few things, really, that a model would have. It would be tear sheets, evidence of high payment, some reference letters, you know, maybe from agencies, or, you know, showing that they were, you know, they performed as, a, as the face of, Dolce & Gabbana or something like that. But otherwise, you know, so I'm going to kind of go through this. Let's see, pretty much the only, you know, kind of entertainment person that would be applied to this higher standard. The next standard, again, which is where most of you would lie, um, it would be, you know, the these are the criteria that are listed. So it's either you are nominated or have won a major award, so an Emmy, Grammy, you know, SAG Award, BAFTA, DGA Award, something like that. And it's nomination or win, by the way, so that won. Or you have to show three of the following. And really, if you, you know, you break it down, it's really, you know, services. So it's for productions and events, which would be your credit, press. Um, number three is, you know, if you've done any major work for big companies. So let's say you're a musician and um, you recorded an album and it was uh, picked up by Universal. That would be a distinguished organization. Um, and then, you know, the fourth one is, you know, ratings or box office receipts. Let's say, again, a musician. If, if your song, you've recorded a song or an album, it did particularly well in your home country, we would show evidence of your ratings. Um, the next one is, is something that every petition is going to, should have, would be the reference letters. That's kind of the easiest thing to be, you know, to get because a lot of you, you know, hopefully are at least well connected within the industry. So I always tell people, the bigger the name, the better within your particular industry. Um, you can ask for letters of reference. You know, in our firm, we typically, you know, help the, you know, help the client, you know, draft, you know, kind of give them some pointers on what to put together. But the letters really discuss either, you know, what if they've worked with you, you know, how, um, how you contribute, what your particular and very critical contributions were to, let's say, you worked on a film together, and how, you know, you were the lead, you lead actor in this film, and the film would not have been the same without you. Or likewise, the letter can be more general, you know, kind of describing your general credits and saying, you know, I know this, I've heard of this person, and they have an international, you know, they have a reputation of extraordinary ability. So that's another thing where you get a letter saying that, you know, that's how well known I am, you know, this person writes this letter. But that should be included in almost, I try to include them in all of our petitions, all of our O1 petitions. Um, and the last one is high salary remuneration. So that's actually, that doesn't apply as much in the arts unless you've had, you know, a, a really big break um, as an actor. Maybe you got a commercial, like a nationally aired uh, commercial, you know, for Coca-Cola or something. That's a really tough one to show, but you can show it. And it doesn't have to be like a year's worth of tax returns. It could be like, you know, I got this one you know, job and I got paid $10,000 for, you know, two days of work or something like that. That sounds really nice, you know. But, you know, it does happen. So, and proper documentation is key, so you need to evidence everything. So, I, you know, again, if you came to me and you said, you know, um, I did, you know, I was in a McDonald's, I'm an actress, and I was in a McDonald's commercial, I would say, oh, that's great. I need evidence of that. I can't just 
we can't just say that in the petition. We would need evidence, either you know, a letter from the casting agent who put you in that commercial, or a kind of a still frame of you on the TV screen with the little, you know, the golden arches on the bottom right-hand side corner. You know, just something, or a pay stub maybe that had, you know, MTV commercial. Hopefully, you're getting like residuals or something from it if it's nationally aired. You know, some sort of evidence for each thing and. It's really difficult for me right now because I'm trying to lump all of the arts and entertainment together in one, but each industry is different. And, and so, like, you know, for music, it's going to be different. Your evidence is going to be different. It's going to be more about the touring and the venues that you've played or the festivals, music festivals you've played, um, or, you know, if you've recorded albums, if your music is on iTunes, if your music has been you know, selected to play on, let's say, the Jersey Shore, for instance, it's not just, you know, it's not just about winning the Grammy or having a platinum album or anything. I mean, there are a lot of different ways you can show show that you're, you know, an artist of extraordinary ability, but you need that to keep the evidence. So those are the basic criteria. If it doesn't, you know, and, and then, you know, something the regulations provide for, if these criteria don't readily apply to your particular field, you can submit what they call comparable evidence. So, um, you know, we always recommend people uh, think of, you know, anything that is of particular note to your field. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, earlier, models, for instance, in that business category, they don't, you know, they don't publish, they don't write articles, they don't hear conferences, a lot of things they don't do. But what they do do, they have what we call tear sheets, which would be, you know, they appear in the pages of, of magazines, you know, all the time. So that's those are kind of the little things that you can add um, that would be, you know, particular to your field. Likewise, an artist, for instance, you know, if your art is selected to be uh, displayed in a particular, you know, in an art gallery, then that's something that you would you would choose. To, rather than, you know, you don't have, you know, TV or anything like that. So, you know, it just kind of depends. But, um, and I should say, I, I see some questions are popping up on the screen. Feel free to use the chat function. I can see your questions, but I'm not going to start answering questions until a little bit later. And um, I just want to let you know, so either write them here and I'll try to get to them. If not, I'll give you guys my email address at the end of the presentation, feel free to email me the specifics of your situation or, or if you have a friend or if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Okay. So let's go back to the other um, big question you know, we, we touched on earlier was the petitioner. So let's say you're, in, you know, you're a musician and you want to stay here, you have had some offers and you really want to get an O1, you need a sponsor, so you need a petitioner. And again, it can either be a full-time, you know, if it's full-time employment, they do have O1. So if you're a chef, for instance, I do those as well, you have, you can get an O1 if you're a really well-known chef and the restaurant wants to talk to you. That's, a, that's more of a, you know, a classic um, employment situation. Likewise, you know, a, a visual effects artist uh, with a studio, so if you're an animator or VFX artist and DreamWorks wants to sponsor you, again, that's an O1, and that's more of a classic employment situation. And you are allowed to have concurrent O1s, by the way, if you want to have multiple employers or sponsors. So if you want to work for a couple of different people, that's a good way of doing it. Uh, the second option is to have an agent or a manager as your employer, as your sponsor. So that really applies to, again, actors, actresses, um, musicians, um, you know, anybody in the entertainment industry, you really would go that route. And um, so I would, you know, the basics you would need, in the classic employment situation, if you have an employer as a petitioner, you don't actually need a deal memo and a contract and itinerary showing what you'll be doing because the employment in itself is um, the 
the employment mm -hmm. itself is, is uh, evidence enough that you have, you know, work for the next, the petition, you know, the petitioner is saying, oh, we're going to hire them as a chef for the next three years. You're not bound to it, obviously, but that's more steady, whereas an actor, you don't know what your next job is, really. So the whole requirement for the deal memo and the contracts and itineraries is to show what you'll be doing when you are here, once you do get that O-1. They don't want to, you know, basically give out O-1s for people to be here to audition or to, you know, write music or to write a screenplay. They really want to know that you're here and you're actually, you know, kind of contributing and you are working in the field because, again, you're supposed to be the person, you know, an extraordinary, uh, you know, a, a writer of extraordinary ability. They want you here to be actually writing. Um, so going back, you know, and again, the itinerary thing really throws people off. Um, but, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's fairly tentative. It's not really binding in the sense that you have to perform, you, you know, have to have those performances. Things change, obviously, in the entertainment industry. It's kind of day to day. There are cancellations and, and there are changes. But, you know, to the best of your ability, you should try and include that. And you are allowed to add, you know, additional performances to, uh, to the itinerary and to the petition as well. So if you're um, a musician and, you know, you said you were going to be performing, you know, at South by Southwest or something, and then for whatever reason that gets canceled, or you get added to, um, you know, tour with, I don't know, Katy Perry or something. I have no idea, but if you get added to a tour, you can add that as well. Again, as long as you're, you know, if you got to know one as a musician and you're going to be continuing, you can add things. But it is a requirement. I just wanted to put that out there, the deal memos and, and the itinerary are requirements. How, how strict and how much information you need to put in there really depends on your particular case and um, who your sponsor is and what you plan on doing here. So I'm happy to answer those questions uh, later. Uh, so tied to the itinerary is the event. That's really what they want you to show is that um, they can, you know, basically they can only be approved for the duration of the event. So the O-1 visa you can apply, maximum time you can request for the petition to be valid is three years. And it's not automatic. If you ask for three years, it's not automatic the way it is in, in other situations. Or if you were an O-1, you know, let's say again a chef and it's full-time employment, you're earning, a, you know, an annual salary then they will probably, you know, they get three years. But for artists um, and entertainers, for actors where you're, you know, paid project to project or models, and I want models in um, because I do a lot of models, but they're business. But a lot of this, the, these, um, you know, specific situations are, are very similar. So I, I just, I'll throw them in there so you'll hear me say that. But anyways, you have to show that you have enough work to put, if you want to ask, if you do ask for the three years, enough work to, string together to make that three years. Um, so, you know, if you can only show that you're going to be filming this one movie for six weeks in, you know, in the fall, and you find out now, they may only give you, you know, let's say from now until, until the fall. Uh, what I like to include and something that, you know, everyone should, you know, think about, let's say you are filming something. When you are filming a movie, there is pre-production. So, I mean, there are a lot of things that go around it, right? So there's pre-production, there's the actual production where there's the actual filming, and then there's post-production where they do a lot of editing, so you may be required to do something. There's also publicity that's done, or if you need to go to festivals or do some other things that are, you know, what we, you know, kind of incidental to the main project. So instead of, you know, that project that was six weeks, it actually all of a sudden is more like, you know, possibly six months or it could go up to a year. You know, when things are filmed, and, and this is similar in music as well, but once when things are filmed, it, sometimes it's not released, you know, for months or even up until the following year. So it is something to think about um, when, you're, when you're putting this together. So we always like to tell people to include that in the itinerary as well. And again, short gaps between events are okay. So um, I'll give you an example, you know, a modeling example where you know they have they shoot this, you know, let's say they shoot this catalog in fall of 
2012 and then nothing until spring of 2013, they're not going to cut off, you know, the O1 because of that gap. If, you know, on the itinerary list, you know, you know, we'll be working abroad maybe for, you know, let's say they do a fashion week in Paris in, you know, February of 2013. So if you can string together, you know, the events to make up the full three years, I think you're in good shape. Another requirement of the O1 is that you need to get a consultation from the field of, of the appropriate union or agency. So in the arts, it should be from a national um, orga organization. So for instance, um, if you're a musician, it would be from the American Federation of Musicians. Um, if you're a VFX artist, it's VES, Visual Effects Society. TV and film, you, there's actually a requirement for a management and advisory opinion. So there are two. So management would be AMPTP and what used to be AFTRA, but which is now SAG-AFTRA, and then from the uh, labor organization. So it's going to be you know, SAG, DGA, PGA, depending on your field. Um, every field, if, and if no appropriate union exists, then you can use a peer consultation. And really, that's just getting a letter kind of like the reference letters we talked about earlier from a prominent person in your industry, so somebody that you know um, that's you know, really well known. And again, I, I'll use um, the modeling <laughs> example because it's easy. There's no you know, wave organization for models, so you just get another letter from another you know, modeling agency or an agent in the US and say, yes, this person is you know, a model of extraordinary ability and I've reviewed everything, and that's you know, basically what I, what I think. Um, Creative directors, actually, are another one that I've, I've noticed. Um, you know, they're not really directors. Sometimes USCIS will come back and say, oh, that's a director you need to ask DGA. But if I go to the Directors Guild and I say, oh, this creative director, you know, can you give an advisory? They, they won't. Um, so there are certain, you know, jobs, or what should I say, certain fields where it's not really that easy to figure out. So, you know, again, you can ask me, but usually a peer consultation will work. And that's nice because it's, it's free. So, because those consultations with, you know, SAG and AMPTP and everybody, those are, they charge. So, it's, you know, on top of the, you know, legal fees and filing fees, it's usually an additional anywhere between 250 to $500, all of the, um, unions or agencies, they all charge something. I think DGA does not, um, but for the most part, they do. You can check the union websites for guidelines, and a lot of you, you know, if you are in the industry, you're probably really familiar with, you know, who it is. If you're an art director, you know, it's the art director skills. Um, and, you know, and I just realized um, we've actually had recently commercial producers, so rather than going through the PGA, because they've been a little bit hard, difficult, you can go through, there's an independent association of commercial producers. So, you know, they are, they are a little bit um, flexible if you can get a letter from a reputable organization, that will work. Um, and that's the, you know, my last, if you do, so let's say people get really nervous, what happens is we put the whole petition together, all of your evidence, and then we, we actually submit it to the, um, to the union to get the advisory opinion. And usually, it, you know, it comes back and hopefully it all works out. But every now and again, they say, you know, no, we don't think this person is a, you know, a, you know, director of extraordinary ability. In that case, and you know, so we are, we're required to get these before we can actually file the petition. If we do get that, and there really is no other way around it, we submit it anyway, and we, with an explanation that the opinion is not binding on USCIS, and that's actually something that's in the regs. Um, that you know, although we're required to get that, it's not binding on them, and hopefully we're able to, you know, through the evidence and through the criteria, can demonstrate that you are actually um, an alien of extraordinary ability, and you know, kind of prove it through the petition, even though uh, the advice, you know, the advisory opinion came back as. Um, you know, sometimes they're just kind of benign and say, oh, this person is not, you know, we don't find them to be a person of extraordinary ability. Some, I've, I've had some that come back with much stronger language and say we object or, you know, we don't find this at all. So 
um, and, and we've had cases get approved you know, with an adverse opinion, but we are required to at least get them because if you file without it, you will get a request for evidence or an RFE as we call it, asking for it, you know, you know so we, you do have to get it. A lot of people, you know, don't say, well, well, let's just submit it and see what happens. They do require it. So you will get a request for evidence and then it will ultimately delay the case a little bit. Just a couple of, I'm just going through really quickly, um, a couple of tips. For those of you, you know, I, again, I don't know where you are in your careers, if you are just starting out, if you're in the middle of it, if, you know, you're listening because you are ready to file, but my biggest tip for all of you is to just save absolutely everything. Everything that you're, you know, that you think your mother would save because she's so proud of you for every, you know, everything that you've done, save it. I can't tell you how many times clients have come to me and, and when I get to the evidence part, they're like, oh, shoot, you know, I had all this press or I had these press clippings, my mother saved it, I don't have it anymore, um, or I won this award, I don't know how to find it, <clears throat> you know, those kinds of things. My, you know, if the biggest takeaway from this presentation is this, if you have it, you should save it. And, you know, now things are a little bit easier with the internet. A lot of your press is online, which is fantastic, so that means it's kind of always accessible. But if you do have, you know, photos or if you have done, you know, they don't accept film reels, so you can't really do that. You can, you know, print things through the still shots that I was talking about earlier. Um, but I think, you know, press clippings just as much as you can, save as much as you can. Um, so let's say, you know, you do the 01 and you are able to, you know, things are going well, you want to do an extension. You can do, if you just do a regular, you know, one-year extension and show that you're, you know, here to continue or complete the same activities that were specified in the original petition, it should be fairly straightforward. But if you are doing an extension, you probably want the three years. So you need to show that you have new events and activities, and <clears throat> hopefully you have some new new contracts or deal memos or projects or something. Um, and you need to update the evidence. Again, a lot of people, I get the question, um, you know, isn't it just automatic? It's just a formality if I've already had an O1 to extend it. Unfortunately, things have gotten really <clears throat> uh, strict with immigration and they are, especially in the O-1 category, it used to be really, really loose, I think, and, and much more straightforward, or and not, I guess I shouldn't say straightforward, but it was, you know, they didn't pay as much attention, I don't think, to the, the actual requirements and regulations. And, and so now they are um, pretty strict with everything. So they, you know, it's not automatic is, is all I'm trying to say. You still have to try and provide some things. And then they also want to know that you've maintained your status, too. So if you come in on an O-1 for, you know, three years and you do one, you know, basically one job, <clears throat> that's not really, you know, one job, you know, two years ago and the rest of the time you've just been kind of hanging out. It's really difficult for me to get you an extension on that O-1 if you only have, like, one, you know, one TV show where you had a guest spot at the very, you know, when you first came in on the O-1. At that point, <clears throat> you know, I would, I would suggest, you know, trying to just, you know, anyway, my whole point is to keep, keep building on your resume and hopefully, you know, the point is to get to the green card stage and, and all of these things that you're, you include in your O-1 petition and then subsequently in your extensions or anything like that should all be building toward the green card case because a lot of the evidence is the same. One last little tiny point is, so when we were just talking about the advisories, you know, you pay for them, and what irks people the most is, you know, we have to request them again. Let's say you change, you want to change agents or something. As long as you're filing, in, if you do change agents, you do need to file what's called a, you know, a change of employer of the O-1. Um, but, you know, you have to submit advisories, and you should be able to submit the same ones if you're filing within two years of the last advisory. Um, but it all depends. Sometimes what's happened now, the language in those advisories have uh, become so specific where they're saying, you know, yes, we, we think this person is, you know, an actress of extraordinary ability and she should be able to come in to uh, act in Footloose. 
well, let's say you change and you uh, want to submit the same advisory, then you know technically that advisory is just for that one movie. So it becomes just kind of a slippery slope. But I recommend trying it at the very least. Um, so let's say you know you file your O1 and everything goes well and it's approved, but then you go to the embassy. That's the next step. You know you go to the embassy to get your O1 visa stamped into your passport. You know there could be an erroneous denial. What they can do at the embassy, they can ask you about the O1 to make sure that you know you are who we said you were in the petition and that you have things. You know basically they can't that can't happen. You know it shouldn't be happening at the embassy. They can't really re-adjudicate everything. So once you file it here with USCIS and it's approved, you should, you know, unless there's, you know, fraud or misrepresentation, which I said here, you should be fine. Um, there's another option that a lot of people don't really know about or think about. It's the B2 amateur entertainer option. So you have to be an amateur. You can't be getting paid. So if you're, you know, doing music or something and, and you're, you, you don't feel like you're quite at the O1 level, um, this may be it may be an option, but you have to be you know it can't be paid and it should be a social charitable kind of or it's like a competitor in a you know a show or, or something like that. So quick, quickly before I move on to the O2, something I I realized a couple of things I didn't really mention, which I I'm sure a lot of you are you know kind of uh, curious about the fees that are involved with an O1. Um, I'm getting some questions here on my screen about that. Um, there's the legal fee, which you know usually is about three, like 3,500, uh, depending you know where you go. But the the government filing fees are 325, and there's an optional um, premium processing fee of 1,225 dollars. And right now, USCIS actually is really great. Both and there are two service centers: there's California and Vermont, um, and it's based on you know where you'll be doing your work primarily, but both service centers are the regular processing is actually running about two two weeks to a month, so it's been really nice. So you don't really need to do the premium processing unless you know obviously processing times change. So then you know if you're if you're not in a rush, then I would do regular. But with the premium processing, it's quite nice because you know let's say you file and. Um, Filming start, let's say you know July 1st, and if you want to make absolutely sure that you have that approval, if you have the premium processing, you know that they basically have 15 days to give you a decision. During that time, hopefully they'll approve it. If not, there could be a request for evidence where they ask you, you know, um, a little bit more either about the credits that we sent in, or they say, you know. Um, prove that you know this article in. Um, this Edmonton paper in Canada is, a, you know, kind of major media. What the, what the circulation figures are on the press you submitted, or something like that. Again, once you submit that, you have another 15 days. So there's, a, you know, kind of a clock where they have to be held within. And then you also have like an email address and a phone number where you can follow up. And again, let's say you have something that's starting July 1st, we could actually like a TV show. We could actually get a letter from, you know, the production company or your agent saying, "Filming starts. We need the decision. Please, you know, give us the decision before July 1st." And there's actually, you know, a little bit of an open line of communication. So it's not just about the quicker processing. It's also about the you do get like, and um, you you get more access. I I would say um, because you are able to contact somebody if you do the regular processing. Um, while the timelines are, are fine and everything everything is actually you know has been pretty nice, but you don't have that level of communication. You can't actually call and follow up on your petition. You would have to call the national customer service line, and, and so that is just something that I did want to point out to you about um, the fees because I've gotten a couple of questions about that. Um, and then you know just generally speaking about you know the evidence again. You know, instead of being vague, I do want to let you guys know. You know, press um, just any mention of your name in newspapers, magazines, online media, um, any credits at all. So, you know, IMDb credits are always really great. Um, reference letters are something you know you always want to you know keep in the back of your mind that you should be able to get contracts. 
um, letters of invitation, you know, if you were in a film, if it's screened at a film festival, whether it's, you know, Cannes or if it's a Venice film festival or it's, you know, a, a, you know something in Australia, <laughs> like a local film festival, anything like that, if you're in a movie that screened or was nominated for an award or won an award, those are huge. Likewise, music festivals um, are really, you know, a great way of, of, you know, kind of meeting the criteria. If you headline somewhere, even if you were just on the bill, if you were much lower, that's fine. Um, but all of those things, you know, kind of build, build um, your, basically your record of evidence to show that you are a, you know, fill in the blank of extraordinary ability or extraordinary achievement. Um, Okay, so let's move on. I just wanted to stop there and kind of talk about evidence for a little bit. Um, okay, so that's O1. That's the O1 visa category. Hopefully, you know, that's what everyone's, you know, qualified for and you shoot for. But for some of you, the O2 may be more appropriate. And I say that because if you're essential support for an O1 artist, um, Basically, we do this a lot for, let's say, movies. Um, you know, a movie, the director, for instance, has an O1. And then, you know, the director has essential support. So it's either an assistant director or, they, you know, different people on the film that have worked with that director in the past. We can get them all O2s tied to that O1. It's a separate petition, and you have to, you know, send in supporting documents showing, you know, that your credits as an assistant, you know, our assistant director, or associate producer, or whatever it is, there's still a peer consultation, um, probably to the same um, labor and management organizations. We have to show critical skills and experience with the O1, with the primary person, showing, you know, you've had a working relationship before. Or this happens a lot too. Let's say you are working or you're an actor on a film and half of it has taken place in Australia. They've already filmed half of it and, you know, the second half of the film takes place in Los Angeles and, and you know, production and filming, you know, is, wants to come over here. We would, you know, in that instance, one person would get an O1 and everyone else would get an O2 and we would show, you know, for continuity purposes, I have that in quotations, that um, in order for the production to continue, you know, it has to take place in the U.S. and all of these people are essential. So this would be for all of the people that are around, um, around the production. So that's the O2. Um, and then just really quickly, the, if you are, and actually a lot of musicians um, or let's say you're an O1 musician and you want your manager um, to, to come with you and to have their own visa, they would also have an O2. So if they were your manager in you know, Argentina, you want them to come here and continue to be your manager, this would be the appropriate category. And one thing to you know, pay attention to is you know, this is really tied to the O1. So for some reason, the O1, um, you know, he files for a green card, then the O2 is left with nothing. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. And it's tied to the O1, but the same petitioner has to sponsor the O2 as well. So if the O1 has it through a production company or a movie studio, the same has to um, support the O2. I just got to answer this one quickly. It says, how long does an O2 last? The O2 lasts um, as long as the O1. <clears throat> excuse me, the O1 last. So again, it's tied to that, and um, it can't be for longer than the O1 because they're tied together. So that's the O visa category. I'll quickly talk about the P visas um, because there are several classifications that fall under the P visas. One is the internationally recognized athlete. Um, or it's entertainment group, so bands. I've done P1s for bands, but you have to be a band, um, you know, before, before you, uh, you ha like you can't be a band, you can't um, be joining a band. This is what I'm trying to say. You can't be joining a band. You have to have been in existence in order for this to, this visa category to work. Uh, the second one is, you know, kind of a reciprocal exchange program, which is separate. 
third is culturally unique performers. So some of you, this may apply, you know, if you play a particularly unique instrument or that's, you know, very specific and unique to your country or your culture, um, or, you know, if, you're, if you know how to do a specific um, dance or performance art that is, again, very specific to your region or home country, um, the P3 culturally unique visa may apply to you as well. So for the entertainment groups, and this, again, will mostly apply, um, well, entertainment groups, you know, I always imagine a band, but I'm sure there are other um, others where this would apply. You have to show that at least three quarters of the members of your group have had a substantial and sustained relationship for at least one year from the time that you're filing. So three quarters of the band have to have been together. So you can't, and you, you know, well, you can't have a new, a, a totally new band. You guys would have to have been together for a while. And the band should have been, you know, internationally recognized, kind of with the same, um, you know, kind of evidence we had talked about with the O1. You would want to show, like, some press, maybe some reviews, and it doesn't have to be Rolling Stone, which would be really nice if you had some reviews of your album in Rolling Stone. But it could be, you know, on an online website like Pitchfork or something like that where, um, you know, in the industry that's, that's well known. Um, but press is big. Again, if you have songs or an album on iTunes, um, you know, any other online press that you can think of, any awards, nominations, uh, you know, your music being listed on specific charts, if, or if let's say you're a Christian music band and you're at the top of the Christian music charts. And again, all of this evidence it can be between, you know, from your home country. It can be from, you know, another country where maybe your band, or you know, again, as an artist or entertainer, just in general. I'm just thinking generally about evidence. It doesn't have to be. A lot of people get confused and they think it all. It carries more weight if it's American press. But really, you know, to demonstrate you're a person of, you know, has that has this international reputation. It's even better to have press from, you know, different parts of the world. So anyway, I kind of went off the track a little bit. But um, individuals are not, you know, are not uh, eligible for this. So you should apply for an O1. If you're in, like a singer-songwriter um, or like a jazz musician or something like that, or a guitar player, something like that, you would need to, to file as an O1. Uh, again, the, just and then the other thing that may apply to some of you again is the culturally unique. You know, to perform, teacher, coaches, artists, or entertainers under a program that is culturally unique. Okay, so that kind of concludes the the work visa option. So it's the O and the P for the most part for artists and entertainers, and hopefully for those of you you know who want to stay or, or stay long term, you built up your credits you're interested in the green, co green card option, which is, um, you know, I think the path for most people, but if it's not, that's totally fine. Some people may already be at the green card stage or might have the eligibility uh, for a green card. So without going too much into other green card categories, I just want to tell you just a quick background. You know, green cards we call employment-based. So right now on the screen you see EB, EB1, there are five classifications, EB1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the best, quickest, you know, green card category, or quickest processing, I should say, sometimes it takes a long time to put together, is the EB1, Alien of Extraordinary Ability. And this one, typically, it can be self-sponsored. So this is actually the, you know, the most common um, and best green card category for artists and entertainers because a lot of you, even though with the O1 you have to be tied to an agent or a manager or, you know, say a production company or a studio, a lot of you don't want to because by the very nature of the entertainment industry or, you know, art, it is, you know, it is kind of freelance-ish. You know, you're kind of, you're project to project, TV show to TV show, film to film, you know, job to job. So. I, you know, this is the way to go. The O1 is a really nice stepping stone, but it doesn't mean you automatically qualify for EB1. A lot of the criteria are, 
similar. So, and, it, and again, it might sound the same, but it's actually, you know, different. You know, the green card standard is, is a lot higher. Extraordinary here is, you know, showing that you are one of a small percentage who has risen to the very top of the field. And right now, in particular, over the last year or so, <clears throat> they've really been difficult. Um, not difficult, I shouldn't say it that way, but they, I think a lot of things used to be approved that maybe aren't, you know, as, you know, readily or quickly approved, but it's still definitely um, doable, and the O1 really is a great way to kind of be able to see it, but the EB1 is great. And it's self-sponsored, which would be fantastic. So I'll, I'll kind of go through that with you guys, and then after that we'll have a question and answer, and I'll try and get to, oh, I see where it was. Um, getting close. So I'll try and get to your questions, and then beyond that, feel free to email me, or if for whatever reason you need to go, please uh, feel free to email me your questions. Okay, so jumping back in. So for the alien of extraordinary ability self-petition green card, you must show the alien has, we have to show sustained national or international acclaim, and that achievements have been recognized in the field. So the evidence is, again, going to look very similar to the O1 criteria. Um, One-time achievement, you know, obviously a major award. So that's always, you know, if you won a Grammy or if you're nominated. Um, but a lot of times, most of our clients actually don't have that. That's pretty rare, so don't feel bad. Um, but most people have to go and, you know, show the three of the ten. So this is basically a, a pretty, you know, this is the list. So it's going to be prizes or awards, memberships. Um, it's not just membership, like a you know a SAG membership, for instance. That's just you know kind of a dues-paying membership. Whereas if you are selected to be a voting member of the Grammys, there it's you know they actually select you because of your you know stature in the music industry, and and there's more of a selection process. So that's where you know you have to be careful with the membership. Um, and we have to show the criteria, because if we don't show it, that we're going to get a request for evidence about it. Um, published material, so that's, again, press. Press is always the biggest thing that, you know, in arts and entertainment that they ask for. Or, you know, or it's the most persuasive, because, you know, it makes sense. If, if other people are talking about you, then it must mean that you are, that you're somebody or you are a big deal. You or your work. So sometimes, you know, VFX, you know, special effects artists are, uh, animators, character animators, those types of people, even if you're doing that for, um, you know, Toy Story 3, you're, you're behind the scenes. There's no way you're ever going to appear on screen or you're not going to be interviewed, you're not going to be, you know, in Us Weekly or, you know, there's nothing like that that comes along with it. So, you know, even if it's about the film or the TV show or your, you know, the band or um, the company, whatever it is, as long as you can tie it together, we like to use that. For the, for the green card, it is actually more important to have some press that actually has your name in it. Um, so anyway, uh, but we do, and then also with the press, it should be, they call mainstream, you know, major or mainstream media. Um, you know, the higher the circulation, the more esteemed it is. You know, before, earlier I used the Rolling Stone example. Obviously, it's great, but not everyone's, you're not going to have, you know, you don't have to have tons of press all from Billboard and Spin and, and Rolling Stone. It can be smaller, more, it can be smaller industry papers or the newspaper. You know, the more you have, the better. And um, so, but that's where we work with you to find the circulation information. Um, judge of the work of others. So, let's say um, you're a, um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to give you an example. Um, an animator, that's a good example. So, let's say you're an animator and you've been asked to, you know, come to this school in, you know, animator school in, in Singapore, for instance, and look at the work of others and make selections for that animator school, or not, not the school, but let's say a conference. Conferences are actually better. Um, that's, that's a good way of showing judge of the work of others. If you're a singer and you're asked to come and judge America's Got Talent or the X Factor, obviously that's a more, um, that's way more prestigious, but I think that actually demonstrates my point in terms of judging um, our beauty pageant 
you know, if you're asked to come and judge that because you're a, you know, really well-known makeup artist or a hairstylist. Um, okay, the next criteria, original contributions. So that's really going to come from letters. You know, you're not authoring a lot of things in the arts. Um, just, you know, display at artistic exhibitions or showcases. Leading roles, high compensation, commercial success. I mean, really, it all comes down to just whatever, it, you know, particular to your field. So awards, press, um, credit, and being tied to big, big productions. The process itself, there are two steps. You can file them together, or you can file them separately. Um, there's the I-140 immigrant visa petition, which you can you, you can actually file that by premium processing. So if you don't, it's, I think the normal processing times are about four to six months. But if you want to do the premium processing, you pay the extra twelve twenty-five, and you'll actually have the decision or a request for evidence. There's a possibility within 15 business days. Uh, like I said, you can file both of those steps together, or you can file them separately. What I usually recommend is, you know, if you're not sure, is filing them separately because that way you can find out because the first step is demonstrating your extraordinary ability. The second step is really, you know, adjusting your status. So that's a lot of the, you know, your birth certificate, the medicals, your bio. You know, if step one is approved, step two, barring, you know, criminal, you know, issues or, you know, unforeseen circumstances, after the second step, the whole thing should be approved. So, you know, again, to, you know, just in case, you can file them separately. Um, and we used to, you can e-file them, and we used to do that all the time. And then just recently, because there are two service centers, there's Texas and Nebraska, and everyone, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people think maybe, or used to think Texas was a little bit easier. Now they've taken away, um, you know, if you e-file it at Texas, or e-file it, that we thought, you know, I did automatically go to Texas. Now it goes actually to the to the jurisdiction where you live. So um, there's no need to do that either. But if you'd like to, you can. Some people like to e-file for peace of mind. And um, that's basically it. You know, once you file that second step, you do get work authorization until you get your green card, which is nice. Uh, for those of you, and again, that's important for, for people who just want the flexibility of a green card. So as I was saying earlier, current issues, um, there is some unpredictability. Um, they are, you know, it is a little bit difficult. We have seen some bad denials, but, you know, things hopefully, you know, as long as you know it ahead of time and we build a, a good case, you should have good evidence then hopefully, you know, it should go through, but you never know. It really does ultimately depend on, on the case that you have and then, you know, the officer that's reviewing it. But we work really hard to, you know, highlight your credits and to use, you know, as much evidence as possible. Uh, one last point, I mean, I, I keep saying, but Kazarian, that was a big deal that came out a couple years ago. And they just kind of added that on top of the EB1 criteria, the self-sponsored criteria. Um, it's a final merits determination. So they really want us to show that you have sustained national and international claim um, because they, you know, they might say that, oh, you're still kind of young or, you know, they really want to show you're at the top of the top and that everyone, you know, that, you know, you're at the top of your field. Request for evidence. Really quickly, they are common, so, you know, whenever you choose to go down this road with the O-1 or the, or the green card process, if you do get a request for evidence, it doesn't mean that your case is going to be denied. They're just very common, and sometimes we get them and we don't know why. They're asking for exactly the same materials that we submitted in the initial petition, and sometimes it's just a matter of kind of rehashing everything and, and, you know, just resubmitting it and, and the case is ultimately approved. So don't be alarmed by the RFE, but um, at the same time, you need to be mindful of it and pay attention and read it carefully because sometimes there are inaccuracies. I've definitely had, you know, RFEs where it's got the wrong client name and, you know, they're, refer you know, they're referencing the wrong newspaper or magazine. So it's something to just 
they're in there. There's the EB2. We're running out of time, so I just want to wrap it up so I can do a couple of questions. EB2 is exceptional ability, and you, there is an exceptional ability in the arts. The only difference with this one, which might not be as attractive to a lot of you, is that it does require employer sponsorship. But I did want to include it here in case you know any of you are kind of more in the um, and this actually applies to a lot of animators, um, VFX, graphic designers, that kind of a thing, um, those kind of arts, um, because usually they work for an employer and, and it's full-time employment, so they're fine with it. But it does require sponsorship, and I kind of laid it out here. You do have to show, you know, exceptional ability. So some of it's similar, but as you know, as you can see, it's a little bit a little bit uh, less stringent as the EB1. And so you want to try to expand the meaning of arts, and, and sometimes you can include sports. OK, so that brings us to the end. Sorry, I didn't mean to rush through that. I just wanted to make sure that I'm able to answer a few of your questions um, really quickly, To I just have my name and my email address up there. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me. Ask me your questions. Give me as many details or specifics as possible. If you are in the Los Angeles, Santa Monica area, I'd be more than happy to, you know, if we email and, you know, you want to meet in person, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, and then just a quick plug, I think, is to, if you would like to receive our immigration updates, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can also go to our website. We have, we're trying to do more of these webinars, so we have some more coming up if you'd like to see our full schedule, please go to the website and feel free to register on those. And um, okay, so I'll just switch over and try and answer a few of your questions. And I apologize if I don't get to all of them, but I will do my best. Okay, it seems like some people had some technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, this question is, if the initial O1 is granted for only one year instead of three years, Will extensions be granted only one year increments, or can you get more time? Um, you can get more time. You know, actually, O1s are renewable indefinitely. I mean, there's a three-year maximum for each petition, but you can continue to renew them, and hopefully the next time you file, you have more projects listed so you can get a longer period of time. Do graphic designers require a consultation? Yes, but there. So for a graphic designer, you would get what we had discussed earlier, which is a peer consultation, because they don't, I don't think there's, I'm not aware of an association or a labor management organization. Um, next question, I was denied an extraordinary ability green card. What are the chances of getting an O1? Um, probably pretty good, because the O1 is a lower standard than the green card. So, I would recommend so, you know, obviously you have all of the same documents and evidence for the green card. You I would just reuse the same thing for the O1, hopefully, and, and it would work out. I'm more than happy to take a look if you want to send me your uh, C V or your credit list. And I'll you know, I'll try and give you my honest opinion. Next question, you said they don't keep film reels. What about music or audio discs? No, they don't. They don't accept anything other than paper, which is really sad, I know, especially in this in these modern times. We do send them, um, you know, we try and include links wherever possible. They, I mean, honestly, I think they Google. There are times when we get requests for evidence back, and, and they find information that we were not able to find. So I do think they Google things, and, and they use the Internet quite freely, but they still don't take film reels or CDs or anything like that. We submit liner notes. Um, as proof of your, let's say you're like a sax player on Rod Stewart's album or something, we would include the liner notes, you know, with your credit as a sax player. Um, how long does an O2 last for? It, it last, oh, I think I answered this earlier. This lasts the same amount of time as the O1 that it's tied to. Can you apply for an O2 under music as manager or creative director when the artist is a U.S. citizen? No, the O2 can only be tied to an O1. It has to be tied to an O1, not a U.S. citizen. I have a really, um, there's a long question, a longer question from a, there's a Greek filmmaker 
writer director. I think it's too long for me to read through. So if you could just copy and paste that or uh, send me an email, that would be great. Let's see, next question. For the recommendation letters, do we need a hard copy signed by the recommender or, or the word dot good enough? We, we're fine with electronic copies because a lot of times the letters are coming from around the world. So if they, as long as they put it on letterhead, sign it and send it to us by email, that's great. We do request that they mail it to us so we can at least keep it in the file in case at some point they do request the original, but we typically file with just the scan um, letters, and that's been fine. Okay, next question. When is it normal to apply for the EB-1 after the three years on an O-1? Um, honestly, if there's no specific time frame. I have clients who've been on, you know, o five O-1s, and, and they're still not ready for the green card. Some people, you know, have had one O-1, and then they switch. It's really more about your credit. And um, I'm, again, I think that I'm happy to take a look at your resume and credits to see if, see if it's an option. Um, you need to remain in the U.S. while the application for EB-1 is being processed. You can, uh, you can actually file it in two ways. One, as an adjustment of status. Two, for consular notification. So if you need to be abroad, we can do it that way as well, but you would have to go to the embassy in your home country for an interview before coming back in. Okay, next question. If you've been granted an O-1 for three years, when should you start the process of applying an EB-1 or EB-2? Again, it's really hard for me to say because you may have a really strong, you know, list of evidence and credits, and I just don't know. I don't know what you do exactly. It really depends. So um, if that person could just send me, you know, either your bio or, again, like an IMDB link or resume, whatever, I'm happy to take a look. But there's no specific time. It's really about you. And, and you know, at the same time, you know, you put in, and I put in so much time and effort. You, I want to make sure that you have a really strong application or stronger. So. I, I try and be as forthcoming as possible, and I think most attorneys will just to tell you what we think, you know, is a good idea, but ultimately it is up to you. Um, okay, so next question. Is that true that in, East, is that in the East Coast it's easier to get O visas than in the West Coast? Uh, I'm in the West Coast, so I'd like to say that no, that's not true, but it, it's it has, it's based on um, where you'll be working and what you'll be doing. So unfortunately, you don't really get to choose, unless you are choosing between you know, an East Coast company and a West Coast company that wants to sponsor you. Uh, you can't really choose, but it depends. I think you know, at the California Service Center for Entertainment, because uh, if you're in California, it's, uh, in Laguna Niguel, I think they're really familiar with the artists and entertainment visa, so you know I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but um, it's worked out for us. So uh, I don't know. Can you? Next question is: Can you elaborate on how an artist could approach a path to green card if they're marrying an American citizen? So if that person that just wrote that, you can email me separately. That's a totally different process, but I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, next question. How well is foreign work looked at? I have a lot of work from Denmark, fair sheets from magazines, newspapers, and a lot of just wondering since it's a small country. That doesn't matter, actually. Um, you know, the more press you have, the better. The, you know, the only unfortunate thing is they do require you to provide English translations of anything that's not in English. So, you don't have to translate the entire article, but I would translate the relevant portions. If it's an interview with you, I would translate the whole thing. But if it's an article that you know kind of mentions you, you know, in one paragraph, I would just do that paragraph. But no, that it doesn't matter. That's what I was saying. You know, wherever the press comes from is great, um, and you know, one is not stronger than the other. Okay, next question. If someone is a fiction writer and does freelance journalism, they're the freelance writers, would you get a consult from the um, 
That is a, it just kind of depends. Um, I don't want you to get stuck on the union thing because it's really not that big of a deal. Um, we, it's just a requirement. So it depends on what you'll be doing and what we're saying you're doing with the kitchen. If, um, if you're being sponsored by an aging room manager and you're coming here to, you know, I don't know, Random House is sponsoring you to be a fiction writer, then we would need to, you know, go that route. So it really does depend on that. So I can't give you a more clear answer. Uh, okay, last question before we go is, are there any size or time business requirements for the sponsors? Great question. And can the artist be a part owner of the sponsored company? Really, really good question. You guys saved the best for last. Um, there is... There are no requirements for the sponsors. It's not like other weekly categories with the H and B or anything. Um, but it does depend if it's an agent or a manager. Hopefully, they're in the business of representing other artists because you know it just adds to the credibility of your petition and the persuasiveness of it. If you know you're doing, you know, but it, I mean, I've definitely done petitions where it's just an individual who manages, you know, a few people. So. There's no requirement on that end um, that they, you know, you do have to meet the other criteria and ensure you have projects. Um, in terms of being a part owner of the company, you know, it, there's a lot of discussion on that, and they, it's been kind of a little bit vague. I don't recommend it normally only because, you know, then it appears very biased and, you, you know, you can't really be self-sponsoring yourself, but again, it is kind of a gray area. The only thing I would worry about too is also when you do get your you know visa at the embassy. Sometimes they do ask you those types of questions. So for the most part, I don't recommend it. But there's nothing. Oh, I just realized the phone number that is. Um, anyway, so that's the answer to that question. Again, I'm happy to answer more specifics. So um, I'd like to thank you guys. I just noticed that the telephone number listed under my name is actually wrong. It's the fax number. So please don't try calling that number. I'll read it to you. Our number is 310-570-4088. 310-570-4088. You can ask to speak with me or you can try emailing me. Email is probably the easiest, but you know, again, if you would like to call um, you know, feel free to call me, and, and we've got a lot of other attorneys here, so if I'm not available, you can ask to speak with another attorney, and, you know, being, again, being in Los Angeles, we are very close to the entertainment industry, and um, I think we can help you if you do have any questions or need our assistance in the future. Uh, please visit our website, again, and check out our other webinars, and like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter for any other updates. And I just want to thank you guys for registering and joining me today. I hope you found this useful. And um, take care. Have a great day.